What's going on, everybody? It's your host, Will Cooper, coming back for another episode of the Hunt Stand Podcast. On today's episode, we're going to be taking a slight break from the turkey action that we've been bringing y'all for the past couple of weeks, and we're going to be talking getting out, living your life, and loving it with Mr. Redbeard Outdoors, also known as Jonathan McCormick. Now, we're going to get John on here today to talk about some transformations that he's been through. We're going to talk about the 75 hard that he's been going through, live hard and getting after it, getting into archery. And we're just gonna talk hunting. You know, John has gone through the rigors, he's gone through some tests, and we're getting him on here today to bring that to y'all. You know, if there's some of y'all that might have some struggles going on in your life, different things going on, we all do, nobody's as greater than the others, but we're just gonna get him on here to talk about that. I think it's great that everybody hears his story, some of the stuff that he's overcome, and what he's been doing lately, and how he's making a name for himself in the outdoor industry. So, we're definitely excited to get John on here to talk about all that, and we really appreciate y'all tuning into the hunt stand podcast if you haven't yet make sure you're subscribed to the podcast rate and review for us it greatly helps us out and we really appreciate y'all doing that because y'all got a lot of other podcasts out there that you could be listening to so we just want to say we appreciate y'all and all the listeners if you're new to the podcast make sure you go and do that and listen to some of the other stuff we've been doing also if y'all can for us head on over to our new youtube channel it's field notes outdoors we've got all of our hunting content that's going to be going up there our hunt stand originals and some other cool stuff that's going to be coming up this fall so make sure y'all head on over there subscribe and if you haven't yet head on over to i either our website or the link in our Instagram bio. I'm also going to be putting it in the description below for y'all to check out. But we've got an awesome turkey hunting giveaway going on right now where we're giving away some awesome gear from some of our Posse Turkey Series sponsors, partners. But we've got a Savage Renegade shotgun. We've got an Alps turkey vest. We've got some TSS shells. And we've got a ton of stuff on there that y'all don't want to miss out on. That's going to be ending on May 31st. So make sure y'all go to the link in the description or the website or the link in our Instagram bio. But nonetheless, I'm going to quit rambling and I'm going to let Redbeard get to it. So once again, we just want to thank y'all for tuning in to the Hunt Stand podcast and we hope you enjoy. All right, brother. Well, man, first and foremost, welcome to the Hunt Stand Podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you've got a busy schedule with work and everything, so thanks for hopping on the podcast with me, man. I appreciate you reaching out and having me on. Yeah, man, absolutely. I mean, I really want to take the time on this podcast to dive into you, who you are. Let's talk about Redbeard Outdoors. You know, obviously, I think I kind of can tell where the name came from <laughs> but uh i just want to dive into it man and i want to talk about your journey because I've, I've followed you for quite a while now um and just kind of seen that the path that you've taken and, and uh i think it speaks volumes about who you are what you do and i think it's a story that needs to be shared i appreciate that it's uh you know it's been years in the making i mean pretty much my whole life uh, I've spent somewhat outdoors. I grew up in North Carolina um, for 18 years of my life. I was there and it was basically Boy Scouts. Um, we'd go out and father son campouts. Uh, we'd do family camping trips. Uh, at one point we had a trailer um, mm -hmm. that we would camp out of, but we've always done camping in the outdoors. Uh, and, you know, I grew up just loving, I, I'm not a big fan of the beach necessarily for yeah. obvious reasons. <laughs> I get sharks. a little scorched. <laughs> no, I get a little scorched out there by the sun. See, it's uh, sharks for me, man. Sharks for me. Oh yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not worried about the sharks. I'm more worried about the freaking the sun. Um, Shit, but, bad. but yeah, so I, I, I definitely loved, and I grew up loving kind of the spring and fall, mm -hmm. um, seasons just cause they're not too hot, not too cold. And uh, we'd always go up in the mountains. Uh, I love the Blue Ridge Parkway. If, if you guys haven't been out there when it's changing colors in the fall, yeah, there's nothing like it. There's absolutely nothing like it. Now, where where is this at? I, I forget. I meant meant to ask you where you're from. Yeah, so that this is in North Carolina where I grew up. Gotcha. Yeah, and uh, I know the Blue Ridge Parkway goes out of North Carolina as well, um, but it's along the Appalachian Mountains. Yeah, and uh, it's just it's it's beautiful. But they're a lot older than the Rockies, so they're a lot smaller. They'll probably look like foothills to a lot of people that mm -hmm. are uh, based out west. And so, um, but you know, I I came out to you. I had never been west of the Mississippi. 
um, been all up and down the East coast and, uh, it's beautiful, very green, uh, humid. And then I came out West, uh, to go to college for a year. I went to BYU out here in Utah Okay, and I was the only school I applied to because I was going to serve a mission for the church. And a lot of schools where I grew up were kind of party schools and I didn't want that influence before I went out and served a mission. Yeah. So got into BYU. I didn't realize that that was a a struggle to get in for most people. Mm -hmm. I got lucky, I guess. And uh, fell in love with the mountains out here just by hiking a lot uh, in college. Went to Mexico for two years, came back and, uh, and, and married someone here in Utah. So I was kind of planted here. And, uh, basically what happened was I was on the verge of moving back to North Carolina or somewhere East. Um, cause I missed the greenery. And yeah. if you get stuck in the city here in the West, it, it seems pretty dry. Um, almost like a concrete jungle. And I, I didn't like it. And so we were talking about moving out East and then, uh, who now is my best friend. Um, but at the time I barely knew him. Uh, his name's Brent. And he just invited me. He was like, Hey, you know, your wife says you're, you love hiking and stuff. I'm going on a hunt. Do you want to go with me? I said, sure. You know, and again, I, I grew up fishing, didn't really get into hunting. I didn't like the tree stand slash elevated stand kind of hunting that just yeah. didn't seem, seem fun to me. So, uh, anyway, I went out with him and he showed me what the mountains really had to provide out here. And ever since then I I've been hooked. Um, what and that's go, kind of the start of my journey. What did y'all go chase after elk, white mill deer? What would y'all do? So that year was deer. Okay. Um, that year was deer. And then the next year, uh, so that was, I hadn't put in for any tags or anything. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to kind of fill things out. Uh, and he turned out to be a really great mentor. Um, and then the next year I put in and didn't draw anything with rifle, um, for deer, but I went out and he got an elk with a rifle. And, um, I walked up on that animal and that even more just kind of got the talons of the West and, and being out here in the mountains, just more dug into me Yeah. Um, because elk are just, I mean, they're just amazing creatures. So, uh, that, that, those first two years were pretty solid for me as far as I've always been kind of a gym rat. I love, mm-hmm. uh, strength conditioning, uh, not so much nutrition. That's been more of a journey for me. <laughs> that's a um, challenge, man. Love, <laughs> uh, right. I, <laughs> hundred percent agree with that. Um, but the gym for me, you know, some people that's the hard part for me. I'm like, dude, I got to have my gym time in the morning. Mm-hmm. Like that gets me started off. Right. And so training was no problem getting the nutrition down and then finding out more and more about gear. Uh, that was something for me that took me down and has taken me and has kept me down the rabbit hole of, I just love messing with gear, getting good quality gear, uh, testing it out in the mountains, putting it to its limits. And, um, and just enjoying that aspect of it as well. So all of that kind of combined uh, created what would be Red Beard Outdoors. Yeah. Um, and then I guess the Instagram started a couple of years ago. I was working in, in an office setting mm-hmm. and uh, and I'd come back from my random day off during the week and I'd show my coworkers these pictures that, you know, I just took my kids out hiking or, uh, you know, we had a toddler and a baby and I'd carry them. And, and they're like, you did all this on your day off? Like, yeah. What do you guys do? Why you know, not? There, right, exactly. I'm like, there's, you do drive everywhere, you know, 10 minutes here, you hit five different trailheads. Yeah. And, uh, and they're like, well, on our days off, we just kind of sleep in and hang out. And I'm like, all right, maybe there's cool. something to this. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so I started posting about it. It kind of caught on. People seemed to not understand that kids aren't a burden, mm-hmm. but to, you know, enjoy the outdoors. You can go to the park with your kids. You can go on a little hike with them, get them loving it at a young age. Yeah. So all of that, you know, started the Instagram. When did the the podcast start about the same time or podcast actually started last year in June. Um, I had been mulling around with the idea. I actually thought about getting into YouTube, Mm -hmm. um, but I carried my stepdad's big camera around uh, for one hunt. And I was like, Nope, (laughs) (laughs) not doing it. Dude, it's tough, man. It is tough. Like I'm just down here in Texas, like trying to kill a Turkey solo with one of the small mirrorless cameras. And that's challenging enough. And it's just like thinking about trying to do that up in the mountains. I was like, I'm the same. You I'm like, Nope, not going to do it. Yeah. It just didn't, the experience for me, like I I was more worried about getting a good shot, the bulkiness of the camera for me, it wasn't for me. Like I love Mm -hmm. the people that can tell a good story with pictures and videos, but I'm like, I've got my phone and that's kind of the reality of who I am. I don't put filters on things. 
I don't edit things. Um, I just like to kind of show it raw. And, uh, and I just take a ton of pictures of my kids, videos of my kids and family, us outdoors, just with my iPhone. And that's kind of what I post. I don't really edit a lot of stuff. I like it, man. So tell me again, what do you do for your normal everyday job? What is it? So in January, I started a new job. I work uh, inside sales for a tech company okay. uh, that provides basically uh, all the DMS system for uh, RV, um, basically power sports, RV, uh, and marine sales. Got and it. I've gotten the area of North Carolina down to Florida over to Alabama. And you live um, in Utah or North? Hmm? Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. I've been trying to work out ways to have uh, work trips back home. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love it, man. So you remind me again, you didn't really grow up hunting though, did you? Mm -mm. No. So yeah. So my, my great grandpa had the foresight actually to buy me a lifetime hunting and fishing license when I was born in 92 um, in North Carolina. So I kind of grew up just like, I would just go fishing whenever I didn't realize that there's like a whole application process, like all this other stuff, like yeah. my grandpa would just take care of it. Cause he, you know, we do a lot of bass fishing. I've done some surf fishing and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, I, I got into, I went hunting a couple of times and I just didn't like the idea of using a rifle in basically shooting lanes on these elevated blinds. Like I love animals. And yeah. for me, I was like, that doesn't seem very fair. Yeah. Um, and it seemed too easy. And I'm like, I can just go to the range and do some target shooting if I just want to shoot stuff. Yeah. So, um, I never really got into hunting out East. Got it. So when did you pick up a bow? I mean, obviously it sounds like after you moved out there, went hiking or went on that trip with that buddy, when did you pick up a bow? So in 2020, uh, I actually, and in, in, so in 2020, I started, really considering, uh, well, the podcast and wanting to share a little bit more of my journey. I had a huge mm -hmm. transformation physically, um, where I lost a ton of weight and felt even better in the mountains. And a buddy of mine, my hesitation was I'm one of those people that's kind of all in or nothing yeah. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to stuff like this. And so, um, he had been the same guy that took me out hunting. He was like, man, you know, I don't really have an archery buddy. Like you would love this. You're into the mm -hmm. fitness. You love animals. You love getting close, the challenge tinkering, that's your personality. You'd love it. And I, I was like, I know, but it's so expensive. <laughs> nah, man. This... Right. God. <laughs> Hopefully our wives don't listen to this podcast. No, I, hope <laughs> <not. laughs> I hope not. Uh, but, but no, that was kind of a big thing for me. And, um, and so I eventually just caved in uh, 2020 and bought a bow. Um, mm -hmm. And, and just, I told myself, again, being the all in kind of person I am, I'm like, I need to do my research before I walk into that bow shop. And I did, and I'd kind of narrowed it down to kind of what bows I wanted, what accessories, um, and what, like even the arrow grains, like I figured all this stuff out before I walked in there, kind of the, a range of stuff that I wanted to do. And then I narrowed it down with the guys in the actual bow shop. Yeah. Um, and wild arrow is an amazing bow shop. Anyone out mm -hmm. here in Utah, highly recommend that you go and check them out. But, uh, they, they walked me through the stuff. They put some bows in my hand. Um, it let me shoot them, you know, eyes closed, how they feel. And I picked my first bow and, uh, and I told myself, if I buy this, if I put this investment in, I have to shoot at least an arrow a day, period, no excuses. Um, and I need to find a way to do it unless of course I'm traveling, yeah. couldn't have the bow with me, whatever. But like, if it's feasible, then I need to shoot an arrow a day. And, uh, and it, within a couple months, I'd already burned through the the strings that came stock on the bow, God. um, it, right. And the, the, the bow shop, they were, you know, they were like, wow. Okay. You know, and yeah. they, we kind of talked a little bit more and, um, anyway, I, I just fell in love. Uh, I haven't mm -hmm. really shot my rifle in a long time. Um, because I just, I, I love the tinkering you can do with bows, with arrows, with, uh, all the accessories and everything like that. So, man, I think that's why so many people are drawn to archery hunting. And I think that's why we've seen such a huge growth just in Western hunting in general. Um, I mean, public land, putting a bow in your hand, tinkering, people can do it in their backyards. You don't have to go to a range to go mm -hmm. shoot. I mean, you can, there's ranges out there, but it's just, it's almost easy. So, I mean, what, what was your first bow that you got? So the first bow I got was the Hoyt Axius. Um, yeah, yeah, it was a that good was bow. Just before, yeah, it was the twenty nine and a half inch. Yeah, uh, it was just before they switched over to the the dual cam system, so they still have mm -hmm. the yokes and everything. It was their last model for that. 
Um, it was a great bow. Uh, I got it to, let's see, I got the 80 pounds because I was like, I've got short arms. I want to have that, you know, again, going down pounds. the rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so um, when I first got it, I was a little disappointed. I couldn't draw it back. It came in hot at like 85 pounds um, out of the box. Yep. And so I had them turn it down. And again, this was again, part of my commitment. I was like, turn it down to 70. Um, cause they do the 70 to 80 pound limbs, turn it down to 70. And then, uh, I'll shoot it for two weeks. And I actually made myself shoot for, uh, I think it was 30 or 40 arrows a day mm -hmm. for those first two weeks. Um, and man, my shoulder was so extremely sore <laughs> and just tired and exhausted. Just wrecked. But I'm, Exactly. But I knew the technique and I had watched enough videos to know how to not actually screw up where it's an injury, Yeah. but I just was sore. And so then I went back and had him turn it back up um, after the soreness had gone away and I felt comfortable with it. And, uh, and I just kept it there. And, and again, reps every single day. Mm -hmm. um, now it doesn't feel like, doesn't feel like the 84 pounds that that one pulls back. Um, and then I just picked up another bow. So I had a crazy, crazy situation happen where, you know, I was listening to Dan elk shape and all that. Yep. He preaches, have a backup bow. And so I made it through, uh, the majority of hunting season last year. And then right before I want to say it was, yeah. So fall Turkey and late season elk, cause I didn't tag an elk in, uh, in September. Mm -hmm. Um, I was shooting at my, my buddy's house and my string snapped on me at full draw. I, I don't, I don't know. Was it frayed <laughs> before? Like, uh -uh, no, it was in good condition. Was it stock and strings? So, no, uh, uh, no. These were the these were top of the line from the company. I'm not going to mention the company because they did awesome uh, customer service and everything. It's not okay. their fault. I don't know what happened, but um, anyway, it was crazy. So I was at full draw, and then you just hear this like snap, and I was like, "What the?" And I had something in my beard, and and my buddy looks at me. He's like, so "You got something right there." I pulled out. It's the D loop. So like it had literally snapped unraveled from the D loop and the D loop was still in my beard. <laughs> like it was the craziest scenario. So luckily I, I had a good friend uh, that works at the bow shop again, yeah. just great customer service. He, he actually provided like he had already done his hunting for the mm -hmm. season, I guess. Let me borrow his RX five, like brand new bow. And I uh, just said, here, go take it to the rest of the season. Cause we're backed up on getting your, you know, strings and everything tuned up. Yeah. So, um, I used that to knock down a couple turkeys and I took it out for, uh, um, for late season elk didn't end up getting an elk, but anyway, long story short. Yeah. It was a crazy scenario, but it convinced my wife that I needed another bow. <laughs> Dude, I guess so, that's what I need to do. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so I ended up picking up another one this year. Uh, did the same process, walked through, shot it with my eyes closed. Um, how the string angle felt and everything like that. And mm -hmm. I ended up with a Matthews V three X 29 this year. So that's so money. Yeah. That's money, dude. I'm shooting the V three 31. I love it. Oh, so yeah. I kind of want to go down. I'm going to deviate off my path a little bit here, but I want to talk about you getting into archery. Um, I feel like this is a topic that um, some people talk about. Some people don't, but getting into archery for the first time can be, pretty overwhelming with all the information, all the gear you got to get. And I love getting people in archery. In fact, uh, a buddy at the nutrition place here in town, I'm getting him into it. Um, mm -hmm. but there's just so much to it. So I kind of want to hear from you. What was that like? Were you really intimidated when you first got into it or what, what was that process like for you? Yeah. So I'm, I, again, I'm, I know I'm a strange individual and in the fact that I'm very, uh, I love the research aspect of it. Mm -hmm. um, I probably spent too much time on it. If you ask my wife, no such uh, thing. <laughs> right? No such thing. Well, well, when she's sitting there trying to talk to me about something important, she knows I'm not listening because I'm thinking about what I just thought about, about a bow or watched on YouTube or whatever. I'd say that's probably a little too intense, but, um, but yeah, so, so I, I found it's hard to find good quality people that aren't just trying to sell you crap Yeah. on, especially social media. A hundred percent agree. I feel like some people's BS meters are, are not as active. I feel like mine in, in that aspect of knowing when I'm trying to be sold on something yeah. uh, was pretty, pretty good. So I ended up settling on, um, there was a couple people that I really liked their reviews on bows and stuff. 
Uh, one of them was uh, Buffalo Creek Outdoors. He's a guy from my hometown. Well, not hometown, but my home state of North Carolina. Yep. Um, and then Inside Out Precision uh, and also Elk Shape. Yeah. And you could tell like Elk Shape is obviously sponsored, but Dan wasn't, he was like, you know, obviously I think Matthews are the best, but if you shoot another bow and that works for you, go for it. Right. Like he has that attitude about things. And so following kind of their steps and especially his idea of always be tinkering. Um, I, I definitely dove down that rabbit hole mm -hmm. and, uh, and figured out again, what bows would work best for me. Um, obviously I want to have all the bows, right. For every single scenario. Same. Uh, right. But you gotta have to find the one that works the best for you. Um, in what you're looking to do with the bow. So yeah. if you wanted to go target, you're obviously not going to even look at the hunting bows and vice versa. So yep. um, that's, that's kind of for me, like, yes, it, it's a lot to, to look into and you don't want to feel dumb walking into an archery shop, but also like I'm a big proponent of value exchange. And so mm -hmm. if I walk into an archery shop and they're slam packed and I don't know anything about bows and I want to pick their brains for two hours on what they think it's probably not the best day to be there exactly and i've had people that do that at again at this shop and they're like they come out with a bad experience i'm like but what did you were you asking good questions or were you just kind of going in and expecting them to hand everything to you yeah and so i recommend to anyone getting into archery don't feel intimidated but do your research ahead of time mm -hmm. like know how to ask good quality questions when you walk into an archery shop they respect you a ton and you don't know, I mean, some of these guys, like I talked to them now, they're up till one, two in the morning, and then they have to be back at the shop at nine the next day because they're so backed up on just tuning bows. Yeah. And you want to sit there and waste their time for an hour. You know, how would you feel in that scenario? I, yeah, I, I definitely know that. Um, cause I used to work in a shop myself. So I, I would like what you're saying, like just on those busy days, like don't, don't go in there expecting to get that full <laughs> process because like, when you're an archery tech and you have just a line full of people, the mm -hmm. last thing you want to have to, I mean, this is probably bad to say for, for me to say this, but you know, the last thing that an archery tech wanna, wants to have to do is when he's got just backed up full of customers mm -hmm. is spending two hours, unless they have the manpower to do that, of course. Yep. And on top of that, like, you know, be serious about like, get the, you can get the pricing online. Yeah. Right. It might be 50 or a hundred dollars off, but like, you know, the pricing of the bows that you're looking at, don't go in there like with all those kind of silly questions. Um, but go in with maybe some educated questions like, Hey, these are the animals that I'm looking to hunt. Um, I'm thinking this grain of arrow, what do you think? Mm -hmm. You know, and if you don't know what an arrow grain is or what the weight measurement is, I just go look it up. I mean, there's so many YouTube videos out there and free information uh, that you can find. And again, those are my top three resources that I found. Um, again, being elk shape inside out precision. He's an awesome guy too. He will respond to you on social media. Mm -hmm. And once you do get into archery, uh, you know, I haven't hired any official coaches, um, but I've sent videos out and gotten feedback on my form as well. And he was one of the guys that you send him the video. He may take a couple of days to get back to you because he's busy, but he will review the video and say, he recommended that I lengthen my draw length about half an inch. And so I took that into the bow shop and they were like, they looked at it a little bit more detail and they're like, Oh yeah, that would actually work better for you. Hmm. And so again, going in with the research done, at least maybe 90% done before you walk into a bow shop is going to make a huge deal. Um, I don't recommend going to big box stores. No, just because <laughs> You know, they're going to hand you whatever's on the shelf. Yeah. Uh, you know, find a good pro shop around you. And again, support that local business is another big thing too that I like to do. Yeah. A hundred percent. And I would say the other thing is keeping an open mind. Um, mm -hmm. Cause I, I can remember there was lots of times that guys would come in and they would just have their heads set on an 80 pound bow and they want to shoot a 650 gray, 650 grain Lincoln log. And it's like, let's see if you can pull back on 65 first and they can't even do that. So like go in with an open mind and not having your expectations set too high. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny talking to some people like, um, you know, out there in, in Oregon where mm -hmm. they work on Cam Haynes bows, you know, they get people, I didn't realize people from like North Carolina will call them and say, Hey, I want a dozen of whatever Cam Haynes shoots. <laughs> well, <laughs> 
uh, they're like, okay, well, what kind of poundage are you shooting? They're like, no, I just want a dozen of whatever he's shooting. Okay, what's your draw length so we can measure it out? I I don't know. Just give me what can. <laughs> you know, like those are the kind of uneducated Jeez. things. That's like, it's cool to shoot what maybe your idol shoots, but uh, you know, again, do a little bit more research and know what mm-hmm. works best for you. I can't shoot like I'm shooting my heaviest arrows right now that I've that I have shot to date. They're almost 500 grains. Yeah. Um, and they're still, you know, we were able to get it to where they're shooting out at about 280 mm-hmm. out of my bow. Um, but if you have a shorter draw length like me, I've got 27 and a half inches either you know get stronger so you can shoot You're a heavier bow 27 and a half yeah i'm only five i'm five nine and a half five ten on a good day so <laughs> dude i'm not like I, I haven't met you in person but i'm not gonna lie like your instagram portrays that you're like six four oh, i wish i'm just gonna say it like <laughs> There's no way you're as short Good as Dan Staten. <laughs> he's, I've got him by a couple inches. Okay? Do you really? <laughs> no, he's, he's got five, some seven. short arrows, dude. He's got some yeah. short arrows. Yeah, his yeah. So, but uh, yeah, I'm 27 and a half to 28, depending. Like when I shot the prime for a little bit, um, yeah. the 28 inch worked for me. Mm-hmm. But a 28 on a Matthews, uh, they tend to run about a quarter inch long. So technically, I'm I guess I'm shooting 27 three quarters inch straw length on this on the Matthews, but yeah, yeah, I'm somewhere in there. Okay, man, yeah. So for all those looking out there that are wanting to get into archery, definitely look at keeping an open mind, doing a lot of research, and mm-hmm. going into the shop, your local shop, on a day that they're not busy. Like if you can get off an hour too early, I'd probably say do that. We'll call them ahead of time that and they're too. more than likely to, to, you know, just let them know, Hey, I'm, I'm pretty new. Um, what's the best time for mm-hmm. me to come in and maybe talk to someone for half an hour to an hour, uh, that wouldn't waste y'all's time. Like maybe even phrase it like that. They might even set up an appointment for you too. Yep. You know, if they know that you're getting into it, they know that it's going to take a while. Like it's two or three hours of time. And so they might set up an appointment. So... All right, y'all, we're going to interrupt this podcast real quick from a word from our sponsors and to thank them for the support of the Hunt Stand Podcast. Uh, first, we got Federal Premium Ammunition. You know, it's federal season. There's nothing louder than a gobble from long beer that struts into range or silence as complete as after you take the shot. Celebrate the ultimate right of spring with Federal. Up next, we've got Work Sharp Tools. Sharpen every knife you own. And finally, we've got Yamaha Outdoors. Revs your heart. So we just want to thank them for their support of the Hunt Stand Podcast, and we're going to get right back to it. Sweet. Well, what I really wanted to dive into, I know we kind of went down a rabbit hole there, uh, but that was something I think people needed to hear. Um, I want to talk about your fitness journey, man, because I think we're starting to see this... um, this movement within the hunting industry that I think in prior years, especially how old are you? If you don't mind me asking. 29. I'll be 30 in a month. (laughs) I'm 29 and holding. We'll go with that. (laughs) What? Yeah. You're only 29 years old. (laughs) So what what do you think I am? (laughs) Dude, I was going to say you're like 37 or 38. I'm 30. Okay. So I'm six, four and 37. Cool. Dude, (laughs) your Instagram, man, I got to tell you, Instagram lies, Instagram lies. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So you remember the days like growing up since we're about the same age, like hunting, it was just all about putting on thick, heavy camo, going and sitting in a tree blind and dudes that probably weren't the fittest. Um, and I love that we're seeing this, this trend, this movement within our industry that people are wanting to be healthy. They're wanting to get in shape. They want to be able to go chase after game, go further, go harder, go longer. Um, I'm not trying to quote any other companies out there, but that's what people are wanting to do. And so Mm -hmm. let's talk about your fitness journey. I mean, it sounds like not only sounds like, but looks like, I mean, on your Instagram, you lost a lot of weight, man. Like you did a hell of a job. So kudos to you for that. But when, at what point did you realize you needed to make a change? So it was again around 2020, which is crazy because uh, a lot of people here in Utah forget we had an earthquake in 2020. Um, Oh yeah. But we we had a bigger, I remember it was a, 
it was a, a Wednesday because that was my leg day. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I was doing squats and thought I had pushed a little too hard because I got dizzy after that set. And then I realized it was an earthquake. What? <laughs> yeah, it was pretty crazy. Um, but yeah, so in 2020, uh, you know, all the crap started happening and that we were seeing around the world, but I had hit my heaviest. I was at 240. Um, I'd hit 240 pounds and, uh, you know, between my kids hitting my stomach and saying I was fat, um, you know, like I'd kind of lied to myself for a while saying I was going into powerlifting, you know, yeah. quote unquote, but like I was bulking. getting strong, yeah. but I was like, yeah, bulking, but outside of, outside of the gym, outside of that hour that I wasn't working out, my back was hurting. My knees were hurting. Uh, you know, clothes weren't fitting right. I wasn't comfortable in my own skin. Um, you know, I, I could make it up the mountain and stick with my buddies, but I knew I was holding them back. Yeah. Um, and I, and I was going through a lot of pain that I didn't have to, Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I could just deal with it and I was fine with that, but I'm like, man, I could, I could experience so much more, uh, by, by losing this weight and then being able to pack another 40 pounds of elk out, you know? Um, and so I just kind of hit that point. Uh, then I did 75 hard. Um, that was kind of, again, I'm one of those people that's all in or not. And, and so I just hit it hard, uh, the beginning of 2020 Mm -hmm. and then all the crap started happening with COVID (laughs) and earthquake and all the other crap that was going on. And, uh, and I just kind of took that as a challenge from, you know, earth, mother nature, God, just to like, well, let's see how tough you really are. And I know a lot of people suffered through COVID and I, I do try and reiterate that anytime I bring it up. Um, I was blessed to not have to deal with any deaths due to COVID Mm -hmm. and, and things like that. Um, but you know, through the lockdowns, like the day I got the email from my gym that they were closing down, I texted my buddy Brent and just said, Hey, can I, you know, I know you you have a squat rack, pull up bar. Can I come work out in your, in your garage? At the time he didn't have the barn that he does now, which is where I, I film a lot of my workouts and and shooting bows and stuff. Um, but he was like, yeah, sure. So next day, like I didn't skip a beat. And if I didn't have that available, I would have probably done the most dreaded thing for me, which is running. Um, oh, I, hate, and, I hate it, dude. I freaking exactly. hate it. Or just some sort of weighted workouts with whatever I had around the house, a backpack, you know, things like that, or body weight movement. And so yeah. like, I was just bound and determined, like the gym closing wasn't going to change anything for me other than where I worked out. Mm-hmm. And so um, I got through that. I think I lost like 20 pounds or something like that, just through 75 hard. Uh, and then I think I put like five more pounds of that on, uh, throughout the rest of the year. And then I ended up, I, so I did the live hard program starting in 2021 and that's where I hit my lowest. I got down to 193, um, by it was by elk shape camp. So I think it was April of 2021. Damn. And, uh, and then I kind of maintained right around 195, just below 200, mm-hmm. uh, through the rest of the year. And it just felt great. Um, it, it felt really good. And I think a lot of people can benefit because you're going to carry the weight either way on your body, yeah. um, whether it's in your backpack or on your body. But if you can go up lighter, it, it just makes you more limitless in the mountains. And Dude, so, yeah. or even in the whitetail woods, you know, Anywhere. Um, being able to, yeah, exactly. Being able to carry out a deer, you know, being able to climb in a tree, being able to sit in a tree stand and not have your joints aching and your back hurting and uh, things burning that aren't supposed to be burned. like mm-hmm. just, you know, all of that can come down to uh, just your, your level of fitness and health. What, what is this live hard program? Like I, I'm, I'm familiar with 75 hard. I did that myself and I lost some weight and I was in hellacious shape. Mm-hmm. And then literally right before elk season, I got COVID. Oh shoot. And, but luckily it was kind of one of the asymptomatic ones where mm-hmm. my wife had it cause she had gotten it through a work function and yeah. so like I basically stuck her on the other side of the house. I was taking care of our daughter <laughs> and I'm like, stay away from me. I got, I got to be up in the mountains in three weeks. Like right? I can't have <laughs> this happen. And I woke up one morning and I was like, something feels weird. I got this little tickle in my throat tested. Uh-oh. Boom. Positive. And then after that just kind of went down, went downhill. But I hear you talking about this live hard. Is it, from Andy Frisilla or, or what yeah. is it? Yeah. So, so 75 hard is a portion of the live hard program. Mm-hmm. So, uh, 75 hard, uh, for those of you that don't know, it's just, it's free. Anyone can go in and join it. If you want to pay for the app, I think the app's like five bucks, 
to me, I like it. It's worth it because it gives you the checklist. It keeps count of the days for you. Um, but okay. if you don't cool, you can go online and find the list, uh, either on his Instagram or, uh, you can, um, I would recommend going through his Instagram and finding the the little printouts that you can get, because if you go online, they can switch it and people change things and, you know, okay. uh, cause Google never lies, but, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but as far as, so, so there's 75 hard, which is 75 days. And then after that, there's three phases yeah. and it lasts an entire year. Okay. And I didn't know this as well in 2020. Otherwise I would have done it then. But um, about halfway through the year, I figured out there was a whole nother portion of the program. So phase one, which is what I'm in uh, right now, okay. is an additional couple of things on top of what 75 hard is, but it's only for 30 days. So phase one is for 30 days. Then you have to take a 30 day break before okay. you can start phase two. Okay. Phase two is basically a 30 day version of 75 hard. The hardest part about that is that you've taken a break for 30 days and you have to jump right back into it. Right. Um, and then you can't start phase three until 30 days before your anniversary of starting 75 hard. Huh. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cause I'm, yeah. so I'm looking at his Instagram right now mm -hmm. and I'm looking at this, the phase one and that looks a little bit, Let's see the five minute cold shower, 10 minutes of dedicated mm -hmm. visualization, three critical power. Yeah. Definitely different than 75 hard. Okay. Yep. See, yeah, I did so it 75 the, hard. Yeah. 75 hard is uh two workouts. One of them has to be outside. Mm -hmm. uh, they can't be congruent. So you can't work out for 45 minutes inside and then go straight to an outside workout. You have to split them up throughout the day. It's supposed to be inconvenient. That's kind of the point of it. Um, but two 45 minute workouts, one of them having to be outside, you have to drink a gallon of water a day. Um, you have to read 10 pages out of a physical book that's nonfiction and hopefully something that's benefiting your goals, whether that be financially hunting, whatever. Yeah. Um, and then I'm trying to remember, this is why I have the app because I forget. <laughs> Same. Uh, so there's, so there's 10 pages of reading a gallon. Oh, you have to pick a diet and stick with it. No mm -hmm. cheat meals. Um, and then no alcohol for me because I don't drink alcohol. Yeah. Um, I put no energy drinks. Um, that's a good one because that's something that I know is not the healthiest. Uh, and so I cut that out because alcohol is not a temptation for me. So, mm -hmm. um, and that's what you do during 75 hard. And then phase one, you add, uh, you know, you have to do eight things on a power list yep. every single day. He explains the power list. I won't delve into that right now, but a uh, five minute cold shower, which actually after your outside workout is kind of nice. Um, 10 minutes of visualization. That's probably one of the hardest things for me right now is shutting my brain off for 10 minutes and just being able to focus on exactly what I'm wanting to do in each aspect of my life. Because I just, I'm, you know, we're bombarded with stuff all day, every day. You want to answer emails, stuff on Instagram, your kids, like your, your wife, your Over, friends. Overstimulation. Exactly. Exactly. And so that 10 minutes of visualization is probably one of the hardest things for me right now, just because of the fact I have to turn off everything yeah. for 10 minutes. Um, but yeah, I love it. it. It keeps me on task. It keeps me, I've, I've been more productive and grown more in the last two years, two and a half years Gosh. than I have probably in the previous 18 years mm -hmm. of my life, you know? And so um, I just love it. it. It keeps me on task. So that's why I stick with it. I like it, man. So how, dude, your mindset just has to be like freaking insane after sticking I'm with this. pretty determined. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I've definitely gotten that. I mean, but shit, I mean, I did 75 hard and I mean, you, you know, as well as I do with kids, that's hard as hell to do. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the thing, get the kids involved. So like my, my outside mm -hmm. workout, I would generally wait um, until the kids were home from school and we'd go to the park and I would just run jog or ruck laps around the park mm -hmm. while they're playing. So they're getting their outside time and I'm getting my outside workout in. Yep. Um, so just combining those things, uh, you know, it doesn't seem like there, there were some, especially the first time I went around 75 hard where like I would lay down to go to bed at like 1130 at night. And then I'm like, Oh shit. 
<laughs> I still got my workout to do. My oh. wife's like, really? And this was the first time I was doing it. So she didn't quite understand the whole program. So she's like, you're really going to go walk around. It's freaking raining at 1130 at night in the dark. I'm like, yep. Can and she's it. like, you're crazy. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I yeah. am guilty of doing that. I, we had been busy doing something and mm-hmm. I got back and just laid my head down on the pillow and the same thing as he was like, shit. So I just mm-hmm. threw, I just threw my pack on. I had like a 40 pound sandbag in the back and I just went and did like, you know, a, a quick mile, I say quick mile and a half, two <laughs> miles. Yep. But man, I mean, seeing what you did, like, hell, I'm just motivated talking about it. Like it makes me want to do 75 hard again and do phase one and, and then do two and then three, like, it, it's got me freaking jazzed up wanting to do it. Like I'm, I'm in the, the end of that 90 day, 90 days of freedom program from Dan right now. And it's, it's yep. kicking my ass. Like I'm on, I think week six, day five. Like I was telling you, it's 400 step ups right now with a sandbag or, mm-hmm. or your pack on back. And it was killer, man. It was killer. Like literally we started this podcast and I was sweating like a madman. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. What do you tell that guy that maybe quit after 20 days of 75 hard or he's wanting to make a change in his life or she, mm-hmm. you know, we've, we've got women that listen to this podcast too. That person that's wanting to make a change in their life, they're, they're a hunter and outdoorsman. What, what do you have to say to help them out? Yeah. So, and that, that's a really good concept. So I'm all about simple and sustainable, mm-hmm. right? doesn't make it easy. Uh, simple does not equal easy, but keeping things simple and sustainable is key. And I, you know, I've got a group on Facebook, uh, Redbeard's Fit Crew, um, and and I do a little bit of health coaching on the side. I'm not certified per se, but I know enough about it that I can help people again keep things simple and sustainable with family or whatever they have going on. I would say if you're just wanting to get into it, just just to get into it, um, and you're just getting started, I'd say add a 45 minute walk to your day and not mm-hmm. like a, you're on your phone kind of just, you know, kind of walking around the neighborhood, but like at a brisk pace, pick a good podcast like this one or mine Oh yeah, or, you know, whatever one you oh, like yeah. and, uh, and, and go for a brisk walk around your neighborhood. Once that becomes easy and your shins aren't burning anymore, add 10 pounds in a backpack. Everyone has a backpack. Everyone has books in their house. Yep. You don't have to buy equipment and just do that for the next, next time you do, you know, and once your shins stop burning from that, add another 10 pounds. And, and then, you know, if you really want to start getting into workout programs, find a good, either hire a trainer or pay for, you know, I, I don't, I love gym. I don't know how Dan's uh, setup is. If he walks you through, through videos, I'm pretty sure he does, he does. on how to do. Okay, cool. So find it, find a, a workout system like that, where they, they'll demonstrate to you through videos or hire a trainer or go to a, a reputable CrossFit gym or mm-hmm. any gym that's got a good dedicated trainer to them and step up your game there. Um, that's, that's kind of what I just, you know, just again, keeping things simple. You don't have to go from zero to CrossFit champion in a day. Like you need to go from zero to 10 to 20 to 30 and keep it simple so that you will sustain that same thing with nutrition. Don't just cut out everything. Yeah, Cut out one thing for a week it's going to suck. But then after the week, you're like, eh, it's not so bad. Cut out the next thing. You know, if it's again, if it's too much energy drinks or soda, if it's, uh, you know, too much sugar, processed sugar, um, you're not eating enough vegetables, whatever mm-hmm. it may be, find someone that can help again, accountability partner as well. That's a big one. Big time. Um, yeah. Cause uh, most people are not as motivated yeah. as, as other people. Right. And so find someone that either is willing to do it with you or is willing to check in with you daily to see if you've done it. Um, I don't recommend having your spouse be your accountability partner. That's, that's going to cause fights and arguments. <laughs> yeah. Fights, arguments. And then there's, there's always that, Oh, come on. You know, it's, it's yep. going to be fine. You've been working mm-hmm. out so hard. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so don't, don't get your spouse involved in that. Don't make your kids, your accountability partner. They can come along for the ride, but don't make them be your accountability partner. Have a good mm-hmm. friend or again, hire someone and pay someone to be your accountability partner. Right. Uh, you know, I'm more than happy to help out if you want to reach out to me um, and, and just have someone there that you can check in with. 
um, that's kind of where I would say to start just, uh, you know, little things at a time, again, simple and sustainable. You don't have to go from zero to 60 in a day. Where has this journey taken you? Uh, well, it's still going. So well, uh, yeah, obviously, <laughs> I, but... no, I, I know I'm just messing with you. I'm being oh, sarcastic. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's my third language. So I'm fluent in English, Spanish, and sarcasm. So I love it. Um, I, love are, it. I think, I think we'd things, get along but... well if we had to share a mountain together. Right. There you go. Um, I, I would say my, the journey, like I look back again, two years ago, um, I am nowhere near that person. I'd hit kind of rock bottom. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say kind of, I'd hit rock bottom. I was, I was kind of falling into depression now that I look at it, um, I probably wouldn't have labeled it that at the time, but I definitely was, I I was scatterbrained. I was overweight. I wasn't happy. Um, and I was just kind of coasting through life. My marriage like was my fault that it sucked, but it like the communication, uh, it just wasn't where it needed to be. Right. That relationship piece of it. Um, and, and I I was a dang good dad, but that other than that, and even then like looking at it, I was good at being a dad in certain aspects, but I obviously wasn't setting a good health example for my kids. Mm -hmm. So, um, that journey has taken me to where I am now to where, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a lot more organized. I've got a much better job. Um, you know, I'm very open and communicative with my wife about whether it be finances or, uh, you know, I just plan things a lot better. Um, you know, I'm more productive in the fact that I can run a podcast uh, my social media, the group and have a full-time job, I probably wouldn't have been able to do that before. Right. Mm-hmm. I just finished my MBA, um, two, three weeks ago. Very nice, man. Um, Congrats. Yeah. So throw that in the mix there. Hell yeah. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, you know, I've got kids, I've got five kids and, and, um, and, and they're all doing well. Um, you know, obviously I, I want the most for them as possible, but, mm. uh, relative to their age, they're doing very well. And so, um, that's where it's taken me so far and where I see it going Mm -hmm. is just like, you know, I don't, I think there's endless possibilities. Um, you know, I am getting to work with some amazing companies that I'm super stoked um, to be starting to do some reviews for their, their products and, and things like that, that I could have only imagined, um, two mm-hmm. years ago. And some of these companies I didn't even know about, or even think it was in the realm of possibilities two years ago. Uh, but just all of that to say, um, you know, I take, I try and take things one day at a time for that very reason, because you can get overwhelmed by looking yeah. forward and thinking what has to be accomplished. And until you get into the mindset of thinking, wow, there's endless possibilities and that's okay. As long as I put in the work, mm-hmm. I just recommend doing things one day at a time, one step at a time, again, simple and sustainable. Every 24 hours is a new set of 24 hours. Um, and, and just taking it one day at a time, man, hearing you say that it's kind of funny, uh, that you say this because I came across, yeah, are you on TikTok at all? Uh, I've tried it. I can't quite get on it. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm there, but yeah. It, yeah, it's it's definitely a different ball game, but I mm. I tend to my feed fills up with these kinds of videos, but there's all these videos that have the it it has a um captions going across the screen that's it's some kind of motivational quote with Mm -hmm. some kind of badass video and music behind it and my feed just seems to fill up with it and one of them that i heard today was actually um you know if you get on an airplane you trust the pilot and you sit back and you relax you get on a bus you trust the driver and you sit back and relax and so it's kind of like why not do the same thing in life? And so hearing you talk about just take it 24 hours at a time just made me think of that exact quote. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, and that's the thing for me too. Um, you know, I, I used to, my wife, again, I bring her up a lot, but she laughs at me for, for some things and she obviously gets a lot of the behind the scenes. And, uh, and so she, um, she used to laugh at me cause I used to listen to a lot, especially when I was at my lowest, I'd listen to ET um really? eric thomas yeah i don't know if you've heard of him yeah i used to like i would replay his videos over and over and over again mm-hmm. to get me out of my funk just to get me going in the day like that was almost like my crack to get me going in the day Small ET. and uh yeah right exactly and so and then from there you know she introduced my wife actually introduced me to andy frisella 
And, um, and so it was, you know, between those two, like I've come to a point where I realized that motivation is temporary is very much temporary. And after that, you know, it can only get you off the couch. Motivation won't get you to do things on a mm-hmm. consistent basis. And so like I post a quote every single day on the story just because I want someone, just one person to see that and maybe to share it, or maybe it'll motivate them to get off the couch that day and do something with their day. Now, uh, you know, after that, it's all about habit and determination if you're going to keep that going or not. I don't believe that motivation is anything more than temporary and just to get you off the couch. Yeah, I agree. Man, I love it. I think, man, I I think we had some really good stuff that we brought out tonight to bring to folks and hopefully you know if somebody's out there that's listening that is in that low spot they can kind of take what take what you've done and they can see what you've done so and apply that to their life and make a change so man it if people want to find out about you tell us real quick where we can find you on instagram and then as well as your group yeah, no, for sure. So on Instagram, I'm red.beard.outdoors. Um, I guess some other people have red beard outdoors or whatever. They're mm-hmm. not using it, but <laughs> so it's red.beard.outdoors. And then, uh, you know, my podcast is Red Beard Outdoors. And then also my group uh, is the Red Beards Fit Crew. And I've got a lot of people I know they're being sarcastic or facetious, whatever, but um, they ask if you have to have a red beard. No, you don't have to have a red beard to be in it. <laughs> Uh, it's my crew. Redbeard yeah. kind of stuck after the first elk shape camp. Yep. Like he knew my name, but just stuck as Redbeard. And that's mm-hmm. just, I've run with it. So, um, yeah, Redbeard's fit crew. I've got a bunch of people across the nation that some I know personally and some I've met on, on, uh, social media that are, everyone's in a different phase of their life. And it's, it's again, kind of an accountability group where they'll find someone that's either your same age or dealing with a similar situation that can help you. Um, I post things on there, such as different uh, recipes and things, uh, workouts yeah. that I do um, just to kind of get things going. So that's where I'm at. Man, I love it. Well, dude. I really appreciate you hopping on the podcast tonight. I, you know, if you kill some stuff this fall, especially some elk, we're going to have to talk some hunting too. What do you mean if? Excuse me. Hey, <laughs> hey, I'm going on year three. I'm going on year three right now, man. So I'm hoping that my tag soup turns into a full buffet here before long. No, this year's my year for elk, man. I, I ate tag soup over a couple of close encounters last year. And I'm Dude, like, same. no way. No way. This year's my year for elk. But I at least get something down every single year. So there's no same. if. It's just win. It's Yeah, no <laughs> if, win. Same thing here, man. Same thing. We'll love it. Well, brother, appreciate you hopping on the podcast. We'll have to do it again soon. Cool. Definitely. Thank you so much for having me. And there you have it, everybody. Another end to another Hunt Stand podcast episode. If you haven't yet, make sure you subscribe, review, and rate for us. It greatly helps us out. We really appreciate it. We just want to thank y'all for tuning in to this episode of the Hunt Stand podcast. We want to thank Redbeard, a.k.a. John McCormick, coming on and talking everything with us and just telling us his story, things he's been through, and things he's doing to be a better father, a better husband and a better man and learning about his background and how he's beginning to make a name for himself in the outdoor industry. But nonetheless, we just want to thank y'all again for tuning into the Hunt Stand podcast and we will see you on the next one.